Christian strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, for the earth be moved, and the mountains shake in the depths of the sea. Though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation most high. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake, God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, we know by the works of the Lord, what desolations God has brought up on the earth. Behold the one who makes war to cease in the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The second reading is from Romans, Romans uh, uh, chapter 3, 19 to 28. Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and other Reformation leaders. No human beings make themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth will be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift to the, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, for whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he, has passed, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works. No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Second reading, our gospel reading is from um, John chapter 8. Uh, Jesus speaks of truth and freedom as spiritual realities, truth and freedom as spiritual realities known through his word. He reveals the truth that sets people free from sin. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham, Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you need, mean by saying, you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And now we have a special treat with um, John Martin, who's going to come and bring us the sermon. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Sue. Uh, those readings that we had, those four readings, including the one from Jeremiah, 
uh, four readings that Lutherans have said for Reformation Day. So we might feel a bit more like Lutherans perhaps today than United Church people. So, well, I offered to speak today because I knew that people would be exhausted, and I think I am too, so anyway, here we go. I hope I'm not like the preacher who dreamt he was preaching and woke up to find that he was. <laughs> You've probably heard that one before. Anyway, today is Reformation Day, if you, if you haven't caught the message. The 504th anniversary of the nailing of the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg by an Augustinian friar named Martin Luther. And today we think about one of the biblical texts which initiated the Reformation and we make a visit to the town of Wittenberg in Germany, it was in Saxony in those days, where it all started. Martin Luther was a troubled young man. As a young Augustinian monk, Martin Luther was afraid of the wrath of God. He spent hours confessing his sins, sometimes six hours at a time, only to get up and remember sins he had forgotten. A very wise man, his superior, the vicar of the Augustinian order, Johannan von Stampitz, that's, is that German for John? Johannan, another one, another John. <laughs> Johannan von Stappitz recognised in Luther a brilliant mind and a way to help him with his fears. Martin Luther was given the task of lecturing in the Bible in the University of Wittenberg. The university was only newly established and Wittenberg, which was more like a village with 2,000 to to 2,000 to 2,500 residents at the time. Luther commenced his lectures with the Psalms and then moved to the letter to the Romans. It was in Romans that Luther discovered that we are put right with God not by long hours of confessing but by the freely given grace of God. Grace, which is the unmerited, unearned love of God. The thinking of the church of the day was that when people died they went to purgatory, where they suffered until eventually they were transferred to heaven. And through the cults of, relative, uh, of not relatives, relics and indulgences for the payment of a fee, people's souls could progress rapidly from purgatory to heaven. Pope Leo X had an immediate problem. He needed to raise funds to finish the partially completed St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And what better way to do it than through the sale of indulgences? And around Wittenberg there was a particularly odious man an excellent salesman selling indulgences. <laughs> Here's that name again. His name was John Tetzel. <laughs> and, and he had a little jingle to go with his sale pitch. And his little jingle went like this. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Now, Martin Luther observed what was going on. His study of the letter to the Romans had shown him that we are justified not by works such as paying indulgences, but by the grace of God through faith. Our children's talk today, faith. Think of the reading from Romans we had today, just picking out parts of verse 23 and 24. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. Well, Luther compiled what we know as his 95 Theses and nailed them to the church 
or the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. Uh, this is the castle church. It's a very tall church and it's a cramped space so we had to have two goes at getting it all into the one picture. Castle church, and you can see the famous door on the castle church. And the 95 theses are now reproduced in bronze on the door. These 95 theses were written in Latin and intended for scholarly discussion. They were a list of grievances Luther had with the church, the papacy, and particularly the cult of indulgences. Someone has joked, we need more people like Martin Luther who only found 95 things wrong with his church. Like <laughs> 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 that, Lindsay. <laughs> okay, and you can see there that uh, this gives an idea of the size of the church. Quite a large door. My wife was 5 foot 2 or 5 foot 1, depending on whether it was a good day or not. This, this, <laughs> this is the castle church. Okay, and not far from that church, it is, down the road, is a square, a market square. With, as you can see there, there's a, in the foreground, you can see shops and residential dwellings above. And above it and be, behind, you can see twin towers of St. Mary's Church. And this was closer to the monastery where Martin Luther lived. This was the church where Luther preached for 35 years. It's a long sermon, wasn't it? <laughs> it was in this building, St Mary's Church, where the ordinary people heard the Bible in their own language, their own German language, from Luther's translation of the old, first the New Testament and then the Old Testament, the first time they heard it in their own language. It was here that communion was celebrated in both kinds. For a thousand years, the laity had been prevented by the clergy from receiving the wine. They received only the bread because they couldn't be trusted not to spill the blood of Jesus on the church floor. And to me, that was a very significant building. The interior has been modified from Luther's day, but it was here. Two of the great moves of the Reformation took place. The Bible in the language of the people, and the Eucharist in the form of bread and wine. And significantly there is a painting of the Last Supper depicting a round table rather than a long table indicating communion of people as a group. Well, you can imagine the Pope and the church officials were not greatly thrilled by Martin Luther's suggested reforms. There were debates and Luther had to defend his 95 theses. And the Pope had those theses and Luther's books burnt. He issued what is called a papal bull, exerge domine, this was a document condemning Martin Luther and telling him to withdraw his ideas. Well, the Pope burnt Luther's books, so on the 10th of December 1520, Luther burnt the papal bull along with the book of church law and many other books by his enemies. The stone indicates where that took place in Wittenberg. And that place is marked by a tree. I think it's such a courageous act by Martin Luther. I mean, the Pope and, and all the authorities could have come down with like a thunder of bricks, but we're not going into it today, but because he had political friends in high places, or a particular friend who wanted some favours, Luther's life was spared. Previous reformers, like John Hus earlier, had been burnt and condemned and all that, but Martin Luther survived. Anyway, the Luther Oak is where um, the, the tree uh, now marks that spot and it's called the Luther Oak, as you can imagine. Well, as you can imagine, Wittenberg is a place of pilgrimage for many people, especially Lutherans. So beside that St Mary's Church that I talked about, there is a smaller Chantry Chapel. 
Chantry tra Chapel, where before the Reformation, priests would be employed by the rich people to have masses said and prayers offered for them. And today, on most evenings of the week in that chapel, there is an English language service conducted by American Lutherans on a rotation basis. And Wittenberg is a tourist town and you can have your photo taken with Martin Luther. And we collected our souvenirs. Jeff, my son, thought as the thesis was nailed to the church door, it would be good to have some nails from Wittenberg. So he went off to the equivalent of Bunnings and came back with some nails. <laughs> my son. I and uh, several other family members received socks. In 1521, at the Diet of Worms, Luther was asked to repudiate his books and the errors which they contain. In refusing, he uttered those famous words, Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. And we all got socks with the words, Here I stand, I can do no other. Well, we bought a copy of the 95 Theses. In English, not in Latin, you'd be pleased to know. But Nolly wanted to buy a souvenir indulgence. So she went to a shop where they sold everything Luther. Books, leaflets, postcards, poster, the lot. Do you have any indulgences, we asked. Now, English is not spoken very much in Wittenberg, and we don't speak German. So at first the man wasn't sure what we were after. 95 theses, he asked. No, we said, indulgences. I tried a different tack. Tetzel, I said, naming the man who had been famous for selling indulgences. Tetzel, indulgences. Oh, no, 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 he said. I am a good Lutheran. I do not sell indulgences. <laughs> I don't think he'd ever been asked that question before. We found examples of indulgences on the internet. And um, there are copies of one such example. And you can pick them up on the table after the service. And uh, upside down, you can't tell really. You, can, you couldn't tell. <laughs> but uh, they're um, in Latin. But don't fear, because on the back there's a translation so you can know what the indulgence was. It, this is dated from a little bit after 1517. It's dated from 1521. So, that's an indulgence. Luther was responsible for many reforms. Indulgences, the Bible in German, communion in both kinds. He also presided over the end of monasticism, closing monasteries and convents and releasing the monks and nuns from their vows. Many of these former monks and nuns married each other. Luther was responsible for a group of women. He found husbands for all of them except one, whom no one wanted. So Luther himself unexpectedly found himself married to Catherine von Bora. It appears that they had quite a happy marriage, producing six children. Their home was the former Augustinian monastery building. Quite a home when you think about it. In addition to the family, a number of students lived with them. At mealtimes, the student would, students would ask Luther questions, and his responses were collected by the students and recorded in what is known as table talk, containing 6,596 entries. That's quite a lot of talk at the table. Many see Luther's household as the model of the reformed pastor's family. He affectionately referred to his wife as My Katie, and she didn't hesitate to tell him to stop talking to the students at eat his dinner. <laughs> Finally, good words from Luther. This is a plaque. Believe in Christ and do whatever needs to be done in your profession. Now, I know you're all sitting there thinking, we talk about the 95 Theses, but what do they actually say? Well, do you want me to start at number one? And, <laughs> oh, they don't, apparently. Well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll let you off lightly and just read one, one of them. And you can understand that I might pick this one. 
Number 43. Number 43 says, Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better deed than he who buys an indulgence. Giving to the poor, <coughs> looking after the needy. See, Luther understood the breadth of the gospel. Justification by grace through faith, yes, is major thing. And he also understood the justice dimension of the gospel, about feeding the hungry, giving a drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked and caring for the sick and imprisoned. And we in the United Church understand that. And one way to express the justice dimension of the gospel is through fair trade. What a, what a surprise. In a world where the poor in developing countries are treated badly, Fair trade basically, as you know, means good wages, good working conditions, environmental sustainability. And of course we believe that here and have recently signed up as a fair trade faith group. So, I've run out of pages so that must be the end. <laughs> so thank you all. I hope we all learn a little more about Martin Luther and um, and the significance for the church today. Let's, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for reformers of the church. Particularly, we think today of Martin Luther. We thank you for his perception of his own needs for you, his own sense of sin and his own inadequacy. We thank you that he discovered, rediscovered in the words of St Paul that the the just, we are justified by grace through faith. And we thank you, Lord, for his courage in standing against the powers of the day, for his outstanding intellectual ability and his ability to communicate <coughs> that message to the people. And we thank you that that message rings through the centuries today as we proclaim the love of Christ in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.